Hello everyone, this is Chantel. Today I want to talk to you about soil health. I believe before you can have healthy plants, you need to have healthy soil. And the health of the plants stem from the health of the soil. We are in a time where fertilizer is not something that is widely available to people. We have fertilizer shortages due to uh, both economical and geopolitical circumstances. The garden can support itself. We can create a, a system that allows the garden or the homestead to support itself without the need of outside fertilizers. Sorry about the lighting. The sun is going to keep coming and going. So you'll just have to deal with that. <laughs> so this is something that I've been thinking about for a while and I haven't really shared this information with a lot of people. I think the way my approach to gardening is different than most people. I believe before you can have healthy plants, you need to have healthy soil. And the health of the plants stem from the health of the soil. If you do not have a healthy soil, you will not have healthy plants. On the opposite part of the spectrum is that if you do have a healthy soil, you are going to have healthy plants, you are going to have less disease, you are going to have more production, and you are going to have less insect pressure. And I've witnessed that on many occasions, and this year I have witnessed the opposite. We have brought soil and compost, both from <laughs> why I see my garden the way I see it. Now to everyone's eyes my garden looks healthy but to my eyes my garden does not look healthy as it did as healthy as healthy as it did two years prior and this is because I have introduced new soil to my garden and also because um, I wasn't able to apply the methods that I did in the years prior. And I will talk to you about these methods in a little bit. This year, because I wasn't able to do that, I have seen more insect pressure, way more than usual, and the plant's health decreased dr drastically. I have seen more diseases on the plants. Um, well, mostly, you know, not all the plants. I can't say necessarily disease, but I can say unhealthy plants uh, because it's not necessarily a disease. And I have seen also less fruit production. Not all plants, I can, I can say that. Sweet peas have been, uh, the uh, sugar snap peas have been producing prolifically and it's hard to keep up with them but on most other plants it has not been the case. And we are in a time where fertilizer um, is not something that is widely available to people. We have fertilizer shortages due to uh, both economical and geopolitical um, circumstances. And I think that the garden can be self-sufficient uh, the garden can support itself. We can create a, a system that allows the garden or the homestead to support itself without the need of outside fertilizers. I'm not against outside fertilizers. I use them all the time. But I think at this time it is important to talk about this because of the issues that we're facing with fertilizer shortages and with compost shortages and with all the soil issues that people have been experiencing this year. I've heard that many people have experienced, um, have received bad soil uh, that has been uh, sprayed with a chemical that um, stunts the growth of the plants and kills them. I don't know if I'm one of them. I don't know if the compost was that way. I don't think so, but I think maybe the, the soil that I bought was that way. Could be, could be not, I don't know, but either way, I will be talking to you about how you can have a self-sustaining garden, or more so, a self-sustaining homestead to, uh, for your garden, uh, so that it can support itself and with, without outside uh, fertilizers and without the uh, worry about creating tons of compost for your garden. I do have 
have a compost pile in my garden and I think there's a time and a place for compost. But this I will share right now with you what I have done in the years past for my garden and the results that I have witnessed. This year I decided to switch completely to no-till garden. Now I have done no-till garden in some of my flower beds and I see the benefit of it and I love it. But I think in particular over here in my vegetable garden, that's probably not what I want. I do have raised beds, so they're easier to manage in that perspective. They're a lot easier to weed. But here's the thing. When you provide the soil with only um, com decomposed compost, uh, compost that has been sitting and fermenting for a long time, the amount of microbiome and the yeast and the beneficial bacteria has would have dis decreased dramatically and the amount of food that you have to provide for the earthworms that are living in the soil has also decreased dramatically and I have noticed that by also I have um, played both sides I have I had a bed where I just put compost that has been fermented and decomposed completely uh, not completely but you know mostly completely in one of my raised beds and the other raised beds I have put directly into the ground uh, the kitchen scraps and any organic matter that I can find and I have found then that when I applied the direct method of composting in the raised beds directly rather than providing decomposed compost into the into the raised bed the direct composting is the method that gave me the most beneficial results and the largest crops and the healthiest crops and um, more crops and healthier plants and healthier soil so what do I mean by direct composting uh, direct composting you could do it in two different methods but there are, there's a benefit for each method and um, and I think both of them combined together you can have a very successful result so um, when you're direct composting you want to um, take your kitchen scraps and put them directly into the soil so you don't want to put them all in one place you dig small holes and in those small holes deep in the ground you put your kitchen scraps in there and you bury them with soil you don't want to overdo this method also because if you do overdo this method now you have a giant bed that's fermenting and that's not good uh, because if you do plant in that the plants could you could cause root rot and all sorts of issues so you want just a little bit of that in the directly in the soil and when you do that, what happens is you have an automatic fermentation process. You have the bacteria that's in the soil. It comes and starts feeding on these um, biomatter and it starts decomposing it and turning it into um, fertilizer for your soil, basically, in essence. And you also have the worms that come and feed on these that are now they're underground. They're easy for them to access. They're in a moist environment. You want to make sure to keep the soil moist while you do that. You don't want the soil to dry out because the bacteria likes the moist soil and the worms like the moist soil. And the decom decomposition process requires a moist soil. You want to think about it as, as if you are fermenting food. When you are fermenting food, you want to provide it in a, so a moist environment. As mostly anaerobic and also you want to provide it with food and most of, most of the time for a fermentation process that's a, a, a certain type of sugar whether it's a vegetable or it's a or whether it's flour uh, but it's the starches that's being decomposed and turned into uh, a lactic acid um, in a fermentation process now under the soil, I'm not a soil scientist, I'm just telling you what I have observed. Observed. I'm just a simple home gardener, but I like to do experimentation and I like to do observation and I do that for several years and see what happens into my, so uh, 
in my soil and to my plants and I also like to do a lot of research and now I'm listening to uh, some I don't know if he's a soil scientist or what but he seems a, like a very knowledgeable uh, person about soil and he helps support a regenerative agri agricultural uh, uh, methods in the um, in, in the agricultural world and they help farmers to have a regener regenerative uh, farming uh, solutions and systems um, and what he says seems to support what I have been practicing for years and uh, he didn't say anything about my methods but I see that what he's saying is related to my methods and I see that what I'm doing uh, sort of corresponds with his explanations of how the soil and the nutrients and micronutrients behave in the soil. Um, if I find a link to his channel, I will link it for you guys down in the description box below. I forgot the name of the channel, but if I do, I'll link it down below for you who are interested in diving deeper into this uh, subject. Now, um, so when you do that, you, you have a fermentation process and you don't need to depend on um, creating a hot environment for your compost. Now this compost pile for me, it's just sitting, it's a cold, co cold compost pile. I have done both hot and cold compost uh, composting, but right now I'm on crutches. I have a micro fracture in my foot and um, I'm trying to have it heal. Uh, so I can't really do anything right now. I'm depending on my family and I don't want to overwhelm them with all the different chores I'm just trying to take it light and easy so that they can kind of learn <laughs> uh, the skills and uh, and just help me out over here so that we can have a crop from our vegetable garden and so that we can have a managed um, homestead <laughs> hey thank you so much for being here and I appreciate you taking your time out of your day and watching this video and I want to tell you if you are a gluten-free uh, person or if you have a person in your life that is on a gluten-free diet I have a free resource for you it's a gluten-free uh, cookbook and it's an ebook with 10 recipes and you can click the link in the description box below and it will take you to the ebook and you guys can get it in your email inbox right away so back to the soil so again now you have a fermentation process that's happening directly in the soil and when you don't add too much of that you can plant directly in the soil you can plant the seeds you can even plant plants as long as the plants are not touching the uh, the vegetables that you have put in the soil or they are not touching the um, you know whatever it is that it might be if they're not touching it directly that's fine because you don't want to have root rot now along with this that's during the growing season this year I did not apply any of that in my garden now along with that during the fall this is what I do um, I take all my kitchen scraps and I spread them all over the raised beds as much as I can whatever I have I spread it and if I find that my compost pile is still not decomposed, I take that and I also spread it all over my raised beds. And then I take grass clippings and I take uh, any leaves that I see on the, you know, uh, any fallen leaves from the trees, all these end up in the beds and I create a layers. So you have down beneath, you have the uh, organic matter from the kitchen, your fruits, your vegetables, your peels, your um, eggshells, all of that ends up in the raised beds and I spread it along the raised bed. And then I bring in the, the leaf matter, I put that down and then I put the grass down. And then over that, throughout the winter, I am taking my kitchen scraps and spreading them evenly over my vegetable beds so now you have an automatic compost pile being made in your raised beds and you have a decomposition process because when it as it snows and if you especially if you live in a wet environment this works really well if you live in a dry environment 
This might not work for you as well. You might need to water the beds every now and then um, to provide them with the moisture that they need for the decomposition to happen. So as they sit, now you have this matter decomposing and yes, the birds might come and you know might take some food from the surface, from the kitchen scraps or uh, maybe mice or whatever, but personally, I don't care. Now, if you want to uh, prevent that from happening, you could put like maybe a mesh over it that you could easily lift it so that you can put more kitchen scraps over your beds uh, to prevent any critters or any birds from coming and taking the kitchen scraps. Now, if a, bir if a bird comes, they're gonna eat something, poop in your bed, that's fertilizer, that's nitrogen and other things that are in it and that's going to be also a good fertilizer. Now, if you have animals, that's even up an extra plus. You take the fertilizer from your animal and you spread it across your beds. During the winter, this fertilizer, again, this is adding more organic matter, it's adding nitrogen, it's adding um, other components. I don't know the details that animal manure has and I would love to do research on that. Uh, the, the nutrients that animal manure has but you have those nutrients sitting in there decomposing creating a um, compost pile directly in your bed everything is fermenting right there and uh, if you want to make it easier for you to plant in them in the spring what you can do is you can mulch all the uh, grass clippings and the leaves before you put them in the bed uh, now, as while this is fermenting, it's also doing something else. It's providing a layer of protection from the elements for your soil. Y you have the wind and um, the uh, soil compaction and all of that. This is uh, this this is fighting all this stuff that you added over your bed. It's fighting all these elements and it's protecting your soil because um, if the soil dries out, that's not good for the soil. You want the soil to stay moist and you also want the something to be covering the soil to protect it from the sun rays so that if, it's, if you don't have any snow over it it's going to be protected and it's not going the surface is not going to uh, kind of get baked and kill all the microorganisms that are living in the soil uh, so that's one element one element and then in the spring what I like to do you can plant directly in that if you want but what I personally like to do is I like to take all that and till it into the soil. I just give my beds just a quick till and then I plant. Um, I have planted in it directly also, but um, if you don't mulch enough, it's a little bit more difficult to maneuver and it's a little bit more difficult for the seeds to germinate. They will still germinate because seeds will germinate in anything. I mean, look here, I have mulch over here and a mat underneath me. Uh, I mean, and a mat under the mulch. And seeds still do germinate and I still have to weed this area all the time. So seeds will find anything to germinate. They germinate in the gravel, they germinate in sand. It's not hard for seeds to germinate, so that's not really the problem, but you would get a higher germination rate if you do till it. And also what happens if you, if you do till it is that you are also introducing all these nutrients directly into the soil and now you have the worms that are in the soil and the bacteria that's in the soil, the microorganisms that are going to feed on these, um, this food that you have given them and then you are, they are going to turn it into fertilizer. I find this to be, I guess you could call it a lazy farmer or lazy gardener's way, but honestly this has been the most productive method that I have observed in contrast to adding compost and then adding uh, having a worm worm farm and adding worm castings and all that stuff you have basically your this your homestead and truly it is your homestead because you're using your animals you're using your kitchen scraps you're using your grass clippings you're using the leaf the leaves that fall off the trees you're using all these and you're putting them back into the soil and those are providing all the nutrients that the plants need. Um, so this method has been way better than adding compost 
I mean, I've added tons of compost into that bed that I'm talking about and it still suffers until today because I didn't treat it as well as I did the other beds. I didn't add as much uh, direct compost as I did with the other beds. I see a bug on my onion. Uh, looks like a beetle. I hope it's not something that attacks onions. Anyways. <laughs> The plants still suffer in that bed and I have showed you that bed in a previous video and you could clearly see that the plants are still suffering and I believe that that bed was sprayed with some herbicide because I've struggled with it for years. I mean we've been living here in this house for how many years? Uh, six and a half years and that bed still suffers. The top two beds were the beds that suffered the most and that and uh, the one on the left nothing I'm sorry the one on the right nothing grew in it on my right over here and the one on my left the top raised bed in this garden over here also nothing grew in it this one on my right I treated like the rest of the beds this one on my left I treated with compost and that I've made and I see a huge difference between both beds um, so I'm speaking to you strictly from experience. I'm not just, you know, sharing uh, what I've heard someone else say. This is my experience, and this is what I've seen work for for me. Uh, now I want to try uh, to implement a similar method in large pots, and I believe large pots can be considered like raised beds, uh, as raised beds, and uh, I will be. Um, doing an experiment on that and I will be taking you with me along uh, on this journey. I have to find a large pot that fits the, the requirements that I have put um, on it myself in order to create that kind of environment and I believe that is possible and doable and I think soil uh, is a living organism and it's full of living organisms and I think we have to treat it that way. And you don't just feed yourself with vitamins. Fertilizer is sort of like a vitamin. Um, you have to eat real food. And I believe that the soil itself also has to eat real, fo real food and not just vitamins. Now, here's the thing. Because the food that we buy from the stores is lacking in nutrients, we might have to add more nutrients to it. And uh, more specific nutrients rather than just buying a specific you know uh, fertilizer right rather than just buying a fertilizer that would cover a large spectrum of things I believe that it might be more beneficial to add specific nutrients to the soil maybe if we do it, um, a plant and soil analysis that helps us understand what is the soil lacking in or how can we um, access those elements that are already in the soil? How can we improve our soil in order for the plants to have the ability to access those nutrients that are already in the soil? And I think that's the key there. And I think uh, starting with feeding the soil with biomatter is the first step. And I think even if you don't do anything else, you are going to have great success with that. I do believe in adding a little bit more fertilizer again because of the lack of nutrients that in the plants in that in the fruits and vegetables that we buy from the store and so on and so forth. I do add eggshells as well because eggshells are full of nutrients also and sometimes if I have a broken egg I just add that in as well because it contains sulfur and it contains all types of phosphorus and all types of nutrients. So um, I think you want to have a varying diet for the soil just as you would have a varying diet, diet for yourself. Bananas, uh, spinach, anything that you have from your kitchen, um, any leaf matter, any plants that are healthy uh, that you take from your soil, you take that and you put it in your, in your bed and you till it in. You don't have to till too much it's just you know you want to create holes big enough to bury those plants in especially um, if you are doing it in the spring you can also in the uh, in the fall you could still till those in 
that organic matter in the fall into the beds and before you add the other layers on top. And if you have any leafy matter, like you know, like uh, plant matter that is too large to till in, you could just simply uh, put that on top instead of grass clippings if you have a lot of that. Um, and that would be uh, a nitrogen source. I just want to take a minute to let you guys know that if you're new here, I also have a blog that goes along with this channel. It's peacefullivingnh.com. I will leave a link for it down in the description box below. And on that blog, uh, recently I have been doing a lot of blog posts about uh, how to grow specific, specific vegetables. So you are, if you are interested, uh, you can go ahead and check it out. I also have a lot of recipes and most of these recipes are naturally gluten-free and I also do have specifically gluten-free recipes that are designed for people who are on a gluten-free diet as such as breads and desserts and all sorts of things so if you guys are interested in all these things go ahead and check it out I'll leave the link in the, des in the description box below now the benefit of grass if you if it is not um, riddled with invasive uh, <laughs> plants and sometimes I do end up with those in my beds um, because, like creeping Charlie and sheep sorrel and I think this sheep sorrel was here anyways in one of my beds before we moved into this house uh, you might end up with those in your bed but if it's just one plant you could just easily get rid of it you know it won't be that hard so before I shared this with you guys um, I didn't really share it with anyone I didn't share what I do I mean there are some people that do somewhat similar practices to what I'm talking about I guess but not to the extent that I went into um, and you know I think a lot of people kind of look at kitchen scraps over their raised beds as you know unsightly or whatever you know and yes it is unsightly but there's a huge benefit to that and if it bothers you you could cover it with something to make it look more sightly <laughs> and to prevent animals from coming in and and digging into your bed and um, you know that is one one downside I think that can happen that you might end up with animals coming in and again put a fence on your garden you could even put a just fence specific fences on each raised bed or you could put a mesh or whatever to prevent animals from coming and that's something I might do um, I also another thing that I did to prevent weeds from growing in the spring um, and they can still grow in what I have described to you uh, what I do and that is by covering them either with cardboard or with a landscaping mat and I used uh, and I use landscaping uh, staples and I staple that into the raised bed and it prevents the weeds from growing at least until I can come till the bed and plant so I think that was a lot in uh, one video um, I know I wanted to talk more I forgot what I wanted to say but I'm sure we will be having uh, more videos on this and more discussions and like I said I want to have a full experiment on this specific subject in pots and I want to see how we can um, implement that into pots. I have my own methods that I'm thinking about that will make it possible and I would like to share this these methods with you guys. I, if, you find, if you found this video helpful please hit the like button and if you are new here don't forget to subscribe if you like these videos and hit the bell to receive notifications of whenever we upload new videos. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you again next time. Bye!